This morning, um, I want to talk about God's abundant grace. And it's interesting because this morning we've already been talking about God's abundant grace. This is something that's been put on my heart. And I just um, I want to thank God and I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just work in me and through me that I can get this message across. Amen. I'm going to actually base what I say on Genesis 32 to 33. Now, because of time constraints, I'm not going to read both chapters. What I will do is summarise. But there are parts of it I will be reading because I want to draw things from them. Now, this, these chapters deal with Jacob and Esau. And they deal with the coming together of the two after many, many years. And it's a, it's a narrative about the brothers and God's abundant grace on them. Now, Esau comes to meet his brother Jacob, who he hasn't seen for many, many years, with 400 men. And this puts Jacob in fear, because Jacob knew what he had done to Esau. He had tricked him out of his birthright, and he had stolen by deception the father's blessing, the blessing of the firstborn. And so he was very fearful of this meeting. But Jacob had been instructed by God to return home to his family and that God would prosper him. And so he's returning home. And when he returns, he's fearful. He doesn't know what he's going to meet. And he's scared. And so he prays to God for God's intervention. And in praying to God, he also decides to make a gift to Esau. And we will go into a bit more depth about the particular gifts he gives to Esau, but he pulls together from his livestock a huge gift for Esau. And he instructs his servants, his family, and he himself humbling themselves before Esau because he is scared and he wants Esau to receive him. Now, in so doing, he's got, therefore, two groups. He's got the group representing the gift to Esau with the servants and the people in charge of the animals. And he's got the second group, which is his own livestock, with his family, etc., and so he divides the two groups. He sends the gift group forward to go and meet Esau. And meanwhile, he sends his family and the other group across the river while he stays put. And he stays put and he meets an angel of the Lord. And we know the story of this fight that ensues. And it goes all through the night. And then... The angel says this morning, let me go. But Jacob won't, not until he gets a blessing. And he gets that blessing. And then he comes the following day and meets Esau. He comes in trepidation, but God's abundant grace is upon Jacob. And I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail. I don't want to give too much away now, but I, I, you probably all know the story anyway, but I want to draw from it. And we see through these two chapters God's abundant grace on Yeah, I'm going to draw it now. I am going to draw it out. I'm going to go into a bit more depth. Because I want, there are lessons we can learn from these two chapters. And I would encourage you all to go home and read them. Because I know you will find even more lessons. But I'm going to draw ten lessons 
from these two chapters, this meeting of these two brothers. And these lessons all show God's abundant grace that is available even now to us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. So can we go up? Oh, good. Okay. I want to actually read from 32, from verse 9, because this is the prayer, and it's an important prayer, because it shows us Jacob's frame of mind. And, I, and it reads, Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I'm unworthy of all the kindness and the faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers and their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sands of the sea, which cannot be counted. Amen? <coughs> the first point I want us to look at is when 32.10, Jacob says, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff, basically the clothes on his back, when he crossed the Jordan, when he had to leave home because Esau was angry with him. And But now I've become two groups. Jacob knew that everything he had came from God. It wasn't from his own blood, sweat and tears. Even though he worked for labor for 14 years, looking after the livestock, multiplying the livestock, he knew and he recognized it wasn't his efforts that made him so prosperous. It was God and God's abundant grace on him. Amen. So the first lesson we can learn is that everything, and we should never forget this, Everything we have comes from God and everything exists by His power and everything, everything is intended for His glory. Not our glory, His glory. And that's Roman 11.36. Amen. That's an important lesson we shouldn't forget. Because God has given us the ability God has given us the provision. God has opened the doors. God has made the way. God has given us the help to work. To his glory always. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's the first lesson. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. So, having prayed, he decides he's going to make a gift for Esau. Now what's really interesting is that we can see just how much God provided for Jacob. This is just a gift. It's not half, it doesn't say half is like half his wealth. It says a gift. So this is a portion. And look at the portion. He spent the night there and from what he had with him he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats. 200 ewes and 20 rams. 30 female camels and their young. 40 cows and 10 bulls. 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. Now we have to realize that livestock at this time is currency. And this is a huge gift but only a portion of what Jacob actually had because of God's abundant grace on his life. Amen. Lesson two. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear the Lord 
lack nothing. Amen. Psalms 34, 9. God, and isn't it interesting, this year, and this, this, this month, we've been praying about being in God's will, having our family in God's will, and we've been praying about <coughs> God's promises, including the promise of the building. And the word I'm going to share with you today is on this. God, is so good, because Jacob was in God's will. Right. So Jacob prospered. Jacob was protected. Yes, he came across trials. But God's grace is abundant and saw him through. Amen? Amen. Amen. Next slide. Now, this is, this is interesting. And there's a fundamental point we need to realise here. In Genesis 36, we read that Jacob, and this is the man who has already been greatly blessed by God, yeah. abundantly blessed by God, and has a promise of even more prosperity because God says, go to your country, Go to your family and I will prosper you even more. But Jacob understands a fundamental truth. You can continue to ask for blessings. God is not limited. He is only limited by us. There is a fundamental truth that you can never stop asking for blessings. Jacob didn't. Even though he had so much, he was still asking for more. And he got it. He asked for a blessing and the angel blessed him and changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Now that is a sermon on itself. Because some may say, what sort of blessing is a change of name? But I can't go there now. We're redeeming time. So, third lesson. Now to him who can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power of work in us. We should not limit God. And, and this is a word that really, um, because we say, oh, well, he's already given me so much. It's very human, isn't it? It's a very human at reaction. Look how much God has given me already. I can't, I can't possibly ask for more. God wants you to ask for more. He's got the world for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, can we get the next slide, please? Okay, this verse, 32, 11. Now, I'm, I've got... Uh, a few points on this, so we're going to repeat this verse a few times. It says, Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. We see here that Jacob is scared. Jacob is fearful. And Jacob prayed to his God. He prayed to our Heavenly Father and he says, save me. And there is a lesson for us right there. Because how many times when we are fearful do we sit on it? How many times when we are anxious do we sit on it? How many times when we are scared or angry or, or something is, a negative emotion is rising up in us, do we sit on it? Instead of what Jacob did, and that's bringing it straight to God. Do not be anxious about anything. Lesson four. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding because you are in a desperate place and yet you have peace. 
That transcends understanding. That makes you, well, you can't understand why you had that peace, but it's God given. Amen. Because it's the abundant grace of God on you. Amen. Which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Philippians 4 6 7. Okay, can we move to the next slide? Genesis 32 11. Okay, so we've got the situation where Jacob knows that he is going to have to face his brother. Now, he has obviously been thinking about this often, probably, for years, because he's in a foreign country, he's in a foreign place because of what he did to his brother. He isn't home with his family, he's in a foreign place, he's been thinking about it. And even if he's been forgetting it towards the end because he was so prosperous, he's now faced with the fact that Esau is coming to meet him with 400 men. And he is fearing the worst. And why is he fearing the worst? Think about the magnitude of the gift that he has given Esau. Such was his guilt about what he did. Because the guilt, the, the gift, reflected how he felt about what he did to Esau. Yeah. If you feel that you've really harmed somebody, you're going to go all out. Yeah. Whereas if you feel that you've just slightly upset them, you're not going to. So <laughs> looking at the gift that he had prepared, prepared for Esau shows that Jacob in himself thought, what a sin I've done against my brother. And it reflected the magnitude of how Esau saw what he did. Yeah. And it's also interesting that here he is, full of fear, yet he has that promise from God that he is going to prosper him if he returns home. Would, would God send him home only to have him killed by Esau? Isaiah 55 11 says, and I love this, I love this verse, and it's not up here, so you might want to make a note of it. Isaiah 55 11 states that my word that goes forth from my mouth, which includes his promises to us, shall not return to me void, but accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing that I sent it. Amen. God's word will not return void. He's promised Jacob to prosper him if he returned home. God's word would not return void. Right. That is God's abundant grace. And it's a lesson for us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Because that's what Jacob was doing. He was leaning on his own understanding as to how his brother would react to him. He didn't know. He couldn't read his brother's mind. So what we do as human beings is we superimpose our thoughts onto other people and say, well, I think this is how they're going to react because it's probably how I will react. But lean not on your own understanding. Because many times that is not in fact what will take place. Yeah, yeah. Or not in fact what they are thinking. And we are setting a trap for ourselves in doing that. So whenever you feel yourself going into that mode, lean not on your own understanding. But trust in God. Amen. Okay, the next slide, please. Again, this same verse. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers and their children. Esau, by his actions and the thought of those actions, has allowed Satan a foothold. A negative emotion attracts Satan. A positive one won't, but a negative reaction in, in us, a negative thought that turns to a negative emotion, 
and track Satan because you're giving him a foothold to play merry with your mind and your heart. He's, he'll come in and he will seek to steal, kill and destroy what you're doing through that negative emotion and thought. We are giving him a foothold. As soon as such a thing happens, we need to say, as Jesus did, get behind me, Satan. Because we need to keep our peace and we need to keep our joy. Okay, um, so lesson six. Do, and do not give the devil a foothold. Ephesians 4.27. You know, this word, it's like a first aid kit for any situation you're in. It's here. By God's abundant grace, he's provided us with the means of overcoming whatever situation we are in. <coughs> because of his abundant grace. Can we get the next? Okay, this is not taken from this particular text, but I think it was, it, it, it bears mentioning. Whatever we do in life, good or bad, it will come back. There is a consequence for our actions. God is a God of order. So whatever we give, we put out, will come back in some form. We just need to take a look at Jacob. Because here, Jacob deceived his brother in order to get his blessing from, the, from his father. And in turn, Laban deceived Jacob into marrying Leah instead of Rachel. So he had to work another seven years. Lesson seven, give and it will be given to you. Now this is in a positive context as to donation, but it can also be if we do something bad, we need to watch ourselves. We need to make sure that what we're putting out is positive, it empowers, it builds up, because that's what we want to be. Amen? Amen. Okay, the next slide, please. So what did Esau actually do? I mean, here we have Jacob in fear for his life, thinking he's going to annihilate them all. In Genesis 33, 9, we read, But Esau ran to meet Jacob, and he embraced him, and he threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. The prayer of an earnest man will be answered. If you are in God's will and you're praying earnestly, God will answer your prayer. And not only does he answer it, and this reminds me of the, um, uh, the, the Christians that were praying for Peter when he was locked up and they were praying and praying and praying and then Peter knocks on the door and they refuse to believe it's Peter. Even though they're praying for his release, they refuse to believe that it could be Peter. Because in their mind, and we do it too, we think we know how God is going to answer our prayer. But here we see this is nothing like Jacob was imagining. And I am sure that Jacob would never have imagined, he may have imagined that Esau might have been friendly, but never so loving. Because God is a God of love, and God cannot be limited, and God will answer our prayers in a way that we cannot imagine, because he's a super God. Amen. Amen. Um, so lesson eight. Elijah was a man like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. That's James 5, 17. Earnest prayer brings results. Amen. Amen. Okay. That's God's abundant grace. So what was Esau's reaction to this very, very generous gift of Jacob? I, 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 this blows my mind. This is okay. So Esau asked, "What do you mean by all these droves I met?" So he was—he 
he was met by all this livestock. And we're seeing how great the livestock was, how much there was. And he said, well, what, what, what do you mean by this? And, ja and Jacob replies, to find favour in your eyes, my uh, Lord, he says. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep them for yourself. Now think about this. Because we know that um, in Romans it says that God loved Jacob but hated Esau. He probably hated him for, for, because he gave away his birthright. But that's a whole different sermon again, some for another time. But God loved Jacob but hated Esau. In other words, he, he, he was disappointed with him, and yet, he blessed him. He blessed him enough for him to say to Jacob, I don't need this huge gift, I've got plenty of my own. Can you imagine? Because God does not have favourites. There is no favouritism in God. Romans 2.11 God does not show favouritism. He blessed Esau and Jacob. It's true. For God so loves the world. He loves the world. We are all his creation. Amen. He loves the world. There is no favouritism. That he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16. We know this verse very well. The point I want to make is God loves everyone. There is no favoritism. Okay, next slide, please. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep them for yourself. You know, Esau had every right to be angry. Esau had every right to be bitter towards his brother after what he did to him. He could have carried unforgiveness. The problem with all those negative emotions is they're like chains. I don't know if any of you have seen The Christmas Carol. And in The Christmas Carol, you have the partner, Marley, come in as a ghost. He's covered in chains. And these are all the sins that he's done, all this negativity that he's done, that he can barely walk. And when we, and that's an exaggeration of, of what is actually happening, when we hold on to these negative emotions, anger, bitterness, hate, unforgiveness, they are like chains that wear us down. And in fact, can stop us from progressing altogether if we're not careful. And so, we know from the way that Esau greeted Jacob that he'd forgiven him. Yeah, yeah. He'd forgiven Jacob. And God blessed him as a result. Mm. Now, we know in the Lord's Prayer it says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. There's a dependency there. We have to forgive in order to be forgiven. And that's borne out in Mark 11.25. If you hold anything against one, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven can forgive you your sin. We cannot hold on to unforgiveness because it will stop us from being forgiven. That is an important lesson. And by God's abundant grace, he's prepared to forgive us. Because, and he is instructing us to let go of unforgiveness because he knows how much that will impede our walk, our progress. Can I brace it? Okay. So, let's stand. And let's give God thanks for his abundant grace.
that is upon us today. Because we've already heard through Eleanor and through Pastor Evangel about how much we already have received through Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us that our sins be forgiven, that our healing, abundant grace is upon us. We are living in a time of grace. We have the Holy Spirit. This is abundant grace. Right. We can enter into the Holy of Holies. This is abundant grace. We can have direct access to God. This is abundant grace. We are forgiven everything. We've heard from Brother David. Our sins are removed as far as from the east is from the west. This is abundant grace. Thank you, Lord. We have food on our table, a roof over our head. This is abundant grace. Thank you, Lord. We have family around us who are prospering. This is abundant grace. Thank you, Jesus. We have so much to be thankful for because we are living in a time of abundant grace. Thank you, Lord. Let us not waste the opportunity. Hallelujah of coming closer to God Hallelujah. during this time of grace because it is the, it's an infinite period. It will come to an end. Hallelujah. We need to make the most Hallelujah. of this time of grace that we are in, draw closer Hallelujah. and fulfill the purpose God has for us. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let's be God.